Chapter 11 of Humorous Ghost Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Blanchard. Humorous Ghost Stories. Selected by Dorothy Scarborough. Chapter 11 Back from That Born. Practical Working of Materialization in Maine. A Strange Story from Pocock Island. A materialized spirit that will not go back. The first glimpse of what may yet cause very extensive trouble in this world. The Sun, Saturday, December 19, 1874. We are permitted to make extracts from a private letter which bears the signature of a gentleman well known in business circles, and whose veracity we have never heard called in question. His statements are startling and well nigh incredible, but if true, they are susceptible of easy verification. Yet the thoughtful mind will hesitate about accepting them without the fullest proof, for they spring upon the world a social problem of stupendous importance. The dangers apprehended by Mr. Malthus and his followers became remote and commonplace by the side of this new and terrible issue. The letter is dated at Pocock Island, a small township in Washington County, Maine about seventeen miles from the mainland and nearly midway between Mount Desert and the Grand Menin. The last state census, according to Pocock Island, a population of 311, mostly engaged in the porgy fisheries. At the presidential election of 1872, the island gave Grant a majority of three. These two facts are all that we are able to learn of the locality from sources outside of the letter already referred to. The letter omitting certain passages, which refer solely to private matters, reads as follows. But enough of the disagreeable business that brought me here to this bleak island in the month of November. I have a singular story to tell you. After our experience together at Chitterden, I know you will not reject statements because they are startling. My friend, there is upon Pocock Island a materialized spirit, which, or who, refuses to be dematerialized. At this moment, and within a quarter of a mile from me, as I write, a man who died and was buried four years ago, and who has exploited the mysteries beyond the grave, walks, talks, and holds interviews with the inhabitants of the island, and is, to all appearances, determined to remain permanently upon this side of the river. I will relate the circumstances as briefly as I can. John Newbigin in April 1870, John Newbigin died and was buried in the little cemetery on the landward side of the island. Newbigin was a man of about 48, without family or near connections, and eccentric to a degree that sometimes inspired questions as to his sanity. What money he had earned by many seasons fishing upon the banks was invested in quarters of two small mackerel schooners, the remainder of which belonged to John Hodgson the richest man on Pocock, who was estimated by good authority to be worth thirty or forty thousand dollars. Newbigin was not without a certain kind of culture. He had read a good deal of odds and ends of literature, and, as a simple-minded islander expressed it in my hearing, knew more bookfuls than anybody on the island. He was naturally an intelligent man and he might have attained influence in the community had it not been for his utter aimlessness of character, his indifference to fortune, and his consuming thirst for rum. Many yachtsmen who have had occasion to stop at Pocock for water or for harbour shelter during eastern cruises will remember a long listless figure astonishingly attired in blue army pants, rubber boots, loose toga made of some bright chintz material and very bad hat, staggering through the little settlement, followed by a rabble of jerry brats, and pausing to strike uncertain blows as those within reach of the dead sculpin which he usually carried round by the tail. This was John Newbigin. His sudden death. As I have already remarked, he died four years ago last April. The Mary Emmeline, one of the little schooners of which he owned, had returned from the eastward, and had smuggled or run into a quantity of St. John brandy. Newbigin had a solitary and protracted debauch. He was missed from his accustomed walks for several days, and when the islanders broke into the hovel, 
where he lived, close down to the seaweed and almost within reach of the incoming tide, they found him dead on the floor, with an empty demijohn hard by his head. After the primitive custom of the island, they interred John Newbigin's remains without coroner's inquest, burial certificate, or funeral services, and in the excitement of a large catch of porgies that summer, soon forgot him and his friendless life. His interest in the Mary Emmeline and pretty boy recurred to John Hodgson, and as nobody came forward to demand an administration of the estate, it was never administered. The forms of law are but loosely followed in some of these marginal localities. His reappearance at Pocock. Well, my dear, four years and four months had brought their quota of varying seasons to Pocock Island, when John Newbigin reappeared under the following circumstances. In the latter part of late August, as you may remember, there was a heavy gale all along our Atlantic coast. During the storm, the squadron of the Nabatuck Yacht Club, which was returning from a summer cruise as far as Campobello, was forced to take shelter in the harbour to the leeward of Pocock Island. The gentlemen of the club spent three days at the little settlement ashore. Among the party was Mr. R. E., by which name you will recognise a medium celebrity and one who has been particularly successful in materialisations. At the desire of his companions, and to relieve the tedium of their detention, Mr. E. improvised a cabinet in the little schoolhouse at Pocock, and gave a séance to the delight of his fellow yachtsmen, and the utter bewilderment of such natives as were permitted to witness the manifestations. The conditions appeared unusually favourable, to spirit appearances, and the séance was upon the whole perhaps the most remarkable that Mr. E. ever held. It was all the more remarkable, because the surroundings were such that the most prejudiced sceptic could discover no possibility of trickery. The first form to issue from the wood closet which constituted the cabinet when Mr. E. had been tied therein by a committee of old sailors from the yachts was that of an Indian chief who announced himself as Hockamock, and who retired after dancing a harvest moon, pa Sewell, and declared himself in very emphatic terms as opposed to the present Indian policy of the administration. Hockamock was succeeded by the aunt of one of the yachtsmen, who identified herself beyond question by allusion to family matters, and by displaying the scar of a burn upon her left arm, received while making tomato ketchup upon earth. Then came successively a child whom none present recognized, a French Canadian who could not talk English, and a portly gentleman who introduced himself as William King, first governor of Maine. These in turn reinterred the cabinet and were seen no more. It was some time before another spirit manifested itself, and Mr. E. gave directions that the light be turned down still further. Then the door of the wooden closet was slowly opened, and a singular figure in rubber boots and a species of Dolly Varden garment emerged, bringing a dead fish in his right hand, his determination to remain. The city men who were present, I am told, thought that the medium was masquerading in grotesque habiliments for the more complete astonishment of the islanders. But these latter rose from their seats and exclaimed with one consent, It is John Newbigin and then, in not unnatural terror of the apparition, they turned and fled from the schoolroom, uttering dismal cries. John Newbigin came calmly forward, and turned up the solitary kerosene lamp that shed uncertain light over the proceedings. He then sat down in the teacher's chair, folded his arms, and looked complacently about him. You might as well untie the medium, he finally remarked. I propose to remain in the materialized condition and he did remain. When the party left the schoolhouse, among them walked John Newbigin, as truly as being of flesh and blood as any man of them. From that day to this, he has been a living inhabitant of Pocock Island, eating, drinking, water only, and sleeping after the manner of men. The yachtsman who made sail for Bar Harbour the very next morning probably believed that he was a fraud hired for the occasion by Mr. E., but the people of Pocock, who laid him out, dug his grave, and put him in it four years ago, know that John Newbigin has come back to them from a land they know not of.
a singular member of society. The idea of having a ghost somewhat more condensed, it is true that the traditional ghost as a member was not at first over-pleasing to the 311 inhabitants of Pocock Island. To this day they are a little sensitive upon the subject, feeling evidently that if the matter got abroad it might injure the sale of the really excellent porgy oil, which is the product of their sole manufacturing interest. This reluctance to advertise the skeleton in their closet superadded to the slowness of these obtuse, fishy matter-of-fact people to recognize the transcendent importance of the case must be accepted as explanation of the fact that John Newbegin's spirit has been on earth between three and four months, and yet the singular circumstance is not known to the whole country. But the Pococians have at last come to see that a spirit is not necessarily a malevolent spirit, and except in his presence, as a matter of fact, in their stolid, unreasoning way, they are quite neighbourly and sociable with Mr. Newbegin. I know that your first question will be, is there sufficient proof of his ever having been dead? To this I answer unhesitatingly, yes, he was too well known a character, and too many people saw the corpse to admit of any mistake on this point. I may add here that it was at one time proposed to disinter the original remains, but that project was abandoned in difference to the wishes of Mr. Newbegin, who feels a natural delicacy about having his first set of bones disturbed from motives of mere curiosity. An interview with a dead man. You will readily believe that I took occasion to see and converse with John Newbegin. I found him affable and even communicative. He is perfectly aware of his doubtful status as a being but is in hopes that at some future time there may be legislation that shall correctly define his position and the position of any spirit who may follow him into the material world. The only point upon which he is reticent in his experience during the four years that elapsed between his death and his reappearance at Pocock, it is to be presumed that the memory is not a pleasant one. At least he never speaks of this period. He candidly admits, however, that he is glad to get back to earth and that he embraced the very first opportunity to be materialized. Mr. Newbegin says that he is consumed with remorse for the wasted years of his previous existence. Indeed, his conduct during the past three months would show that this regret is genuine. He has discarded his eccentric costume and dressed like a reasonable spirit. He has not touched liquor since his reappearance. He has embarked in the porgy oil business and his operation already rivals that of Hodgson, his old partner, in The Mary Emmeline and the Pretty Boy. By the way, Newbegin threatens to sue Hodgson for his individed quarter in each of these vessels, and this interesting case, therefore, bids fair to be thoroughly investigated in the courts. As a businessman, he is generally esteemed on the island, although there is a noticeable reluctance to discount his paper at long dates. In short, Mr. Newbegin is a most respectable citizen, if a dead man can be a citizen, and has announced his intention of running for the next legislature. In conclusion, and now, my dear, I have told you the substance of all I know respecting this strange, strange case. Yet, after all, why so strange? We accepted materialization at Chitterden. Is this any more than the logical issue of that admission? If the spirit may return to earth, clothed in flesh and blood, and all the physical attributes of humanity, why may it not remain on earth as long as it sees fit? Thinking of it from whatever standpoint, I cannot but regard John Newbegin as the pioneer of a possibly large immigration from the spirit world. The bars once down, a whole flock will come trooping back to earth. Death will lose its significance altogether. And when I think of the disturbance which will result in our social relations, of the overthrow of all accepted institutions, and of the nullification of all principles of political economy, law, and religion, I am lost in perplexity and apprehension. End chapter 11